Hey guys, back to part three here for our uh, review of our protocols. We're gonna pick up with sepsis. Uh, they've added a couple things to this protocol, uh, suspected infection, uh, immunosuppressed type patients. Uh, they've also added some different age ranges along with some vital signs there. Now, temperatures, if they have a temp greater or equal to 100 or less than or equal to 97, they'd fall in that category. Remember, our initial compensation is to spike a fever so we can kill that infection, right? Um, but at a certain point, you're gonna burn that mechanism up and now you're gonna go over the hill and now you could be in cold sepsis. So don't forget, they don't have to be hot to be septic. Now, of course, heart rates are gonna be elevated because their whole system's kind of on overload right now. Everything's working harder. Respiratory rate's gonna be a little bit higher <clears throat> and their glucose is gonna be dumping out. So glucose greater than 140 would fit criteria. And of course, they'll probably be altered by this point. Uh, look for the shock findings. So BP less than 90 systolic or MAP less than 65. Um, or if during your care, you suddenly notice with trending vitals that they drop over 40 points. That's pretty significant. Remember with kids, our formula is gonna be 70 plus two times the age. We went over this on the last video. So again, two year old, two times two is four plus 70, 74 is your minimum systolic pressure. Um, end titles are probably gonna be a little bit lower for a couple of reasons. One, they're not perfusing adequately. So they're not gonna get that CO2 all circulated around through the lungs to even come out. <clears throat> and the fact that their respiratory rate has gone up, now they're hyperventilating, so they're gonna blow some more CO2 off that's within that system. Their O2 sats are probably gonna be a little bit lower. Uh, criteria here, less than 92%. So make sure that we are oxygenating them. Um, I found with super, super sick septic patients, uh, their biggest issue is usually oxygenation, okay? So maximize it. Uh, look for cap refill. If it's delayed greater than three seconds, that'd be significant. Best thing we can do for that is fluid boluses, 20 cc's per kilo, IV, IO, get them to the hospital, okay? We know they're gonna need some antibiotics and some further treatment beyond our scope. If they are super shocky um, and fluids aren't responding, then follow your shock, shock protocol, and that's gonna tell you to give uh, push dose epis, okay? Now, if a patient is nauseous or vomiting, we're gonna give a fluid bolus, 500 cc's at a time, uh, and up to 30 cc's per kilo, and we're gonna give our Zofran. However, last year we could give up to eight milligrams, now we're maxed at four milligrams, oral, sublingual, or IV. Now, hopefully you've got tablets if you're gonna go orally, but if you don't and you can't get an IV, then you can actually draw the, the vial medication up and you can just squirt it into their mouth, okay? It tastes like garbage. They might vomit just from the taste, but as long as they can hold it down, uh, hopefully that'll get in their system and help them out. With kids, 10 to 20 cc's per kilo IV fluid bolus, and then we can give Zofran at 0.15 milligram per kilogram to a max of the four. All right, looking at cardiac here. So they, they've got a little more specific about oxygenation here. In the past, it used to say give oxygen if indicated, I believe, um, but it wasn't real specific. Now, I think there's still some debate out there as far as oxygen toxicity. I'm a big believer of it. If you have a patient who is greater than 94%, no signs of difficulty breathing, no signs of hypoxia, they don't need oxygen. The problem is something else, okay? Um, and by giving them, just blasting them with like a non rebreather like we used to always do, could actually cause more harm than good, okay? So if their SATs are slightly less than 94, instead of putting this chest pain patient on a non rebreather maybe they can just get away with the cannula, okay? Um, try that out first, see how they feel. If they're but again, if their pulse ox is greater than 94%, no signs of hypoxia, then we're gonna move on, okay? Aspirin's still gonna be the same, up to 325, um, or we can give four of our 81 milligram tablets, and we can give nitro up to three rounds, um, as long as their blood pressure is greater than 100. Now this is different, it used to be 100 for EMTs, and you could give it over 90 for medics. However, now, 100 systolic across the board, okay? Of course, we need to look at our ED drugs. It states here that if they've taken any ED drugs within 24 to 48 hours, we're probably not gonna be given our nitro. 
because we don't want to stack on those vasodilators. Now, for STEMI only, and you can see this uh, right here. For STEMI only, you can consider treating chest pain uh, unresponsive to nitrates with morphine or fentanyl, okay? I kind of have a hard time with this one um, because there are many MIs that don't present as a STEMI on a 12 lead, okay? The non-STEMI MIs. Uh, if you truly believe that this is a cardiac patient, that they are having a heart attack, uh, and, but you're not quite seeing any elevation or depression on a 12 lead, and nitro is not working, I would go ahead and call the doctor and I would ask to give them morphine or fentanyl. Okay. <clears throat> now, keep in mind, remember, of all these drugs, aspirin, nitro, morphine, fentanyl, what is the ultimate number one thing we can do for a cardiac MI? Aspirin. Remember, aspirin, as silly as it seems, like we don't really put too much weight into it, that's the best thing you can possibly do. Okay, Get it on there. Make sure you get a 12 lead within like five minutes. Uh, transmit it to the hospital so they can see exactly what you're looking at. Under bradycardia, heart rate less than 60. Uh, for kids, if their heart rate's less than 60, what we wanna do is get an airway on them ASAP. Okay, so positive pressure ventilation, high flow O2, probably give it about 30 seconds to a minute. If they're not responding to that, then we're gonna go ahead and follow our cardiac arrest algorithm and start doing chest compressions, okay? If that heart rate's greater than 60, but less than 100, positive pressure ventilation, okay? And if they're greater than 100 on a heart rate, then we're just looking at their airway rate rhythm quality to determine what kind of airway device we need to do for them, okay? Of course, if they're hypotensive, we're gonna give them fluid boluses. Uh, for bradycardia here, it says 500 milliliters IVIO for adults. You can do uh, 20 cc's per kilo for kids. If their blood pressure really stinks, then we can go ahead and start those push dose pressors, okay? But remember for the old algorithm for bradycardia used to be all puppy dogs eat, atropine paste, dope, epi, infusion, right? But remember dopamine and epi are out. So we're gonna start with atropine, okay? Unless it's the blocks, then we'll probably skip it. Uh, if they're unstable, we're gonna jump right to transcutaneous pacing. And then if they're still hypotensive, we give the push dose epi. Now with pacing, they always say consider sedation or pain control. Keep in mind when we're pacing, it's usually because they are unstable, uh, meaning their blood pressure is crap, their mentation is crap. So um, giving them a sedative or some kind of like morphine or fentanyl, Versed, any of those meds, we run the risk of dropping pressures even further. Okay, so I would consider sedation, but skip it for now, go straight to pacing them, get their blood pressures up, get them to a stable limit, and then as they're sitting there probably yelling at you because they're hurting, then we can make them comfortable, okay? Remember, pain never killed anybody. If anything, pain keeps you alive because it stimulates that sympathetic nervous system, okay? So get them stable, fluids, pace, and then we can consider making them more comfortable with Versed, Valium, Fentanyl, whatever. <clears throat> uh, for this one, they're actually saying uh, Versed, one milligram, IV, IO, slow, every two to three minutes, max of five milligrams. Or Ativan, one milligram, IV, IO, every five to 10 minutes, up to a max of four milligrams. For kids, it's gonna be 0.1 milligram per kilo Versed, or 0.1 milligram per kilo for Ativan. Again, reassess, give more as you need it. For tachycardia, this is anything over 100 for adults. Now keep in mind with pediatrics, you're probably gonna wanna refer to one of your charts and figure out, okay, what's their age, what's their weight, and what's normal for that age range as far as vital signs. I think we get into this trap because we're so used to dealing with adults and we know a normal heart rate is 60 to 100 for adults. Well, when you see, I don't know, let's say a three-year-old with a heart rate of like 110, we go, oh no, that's tachycardic. No, you gotta remember, it's a kid. They're usually gonna have faster heart rates, okay? So that's probably perfectly fine for them. Um, and the opposite is true. Let's say you have that three-year-old with a heart rate of, say, 70, but they're showing signs of poor perfusion, they're not responding well, you know, and we think, oh, 70, that's normal. For an adult, it's not normal for that little kid, okay? That could be extremely bradycardic for that kid. So we'd have to follow that bradycardic algorithm. Um, but sticking to adults, heart rate greater than 100. 
here's all your options, okay? You're gonna have to determine, is this a narrow complex tachycardia or is it a wide complex tachycardia? Um, good thing for you, if you can't figure that out, the protocol pretty much sticks the same, okay? There's been a lot of discussion about, um, you know, when I do my 12 week classes, I'll show my students rhythms and I'll ask them, is that VTAC or is this something else? Okay, could it be one of those SVTs with the Barency? Could it be an AFib, a flutter with RBR um, that appears to be wide? Um, <clears throat> regardless, just to make things simple, so you're not arguing about this with your partner in front of a patient, follow the protocol. The protocol is set up to cover your butt even if you misinterpret that rhythm, okay? Um, if it's narrow and super fast, with SVT, we know we're gonna start with adenosine, six milligrams initially, then we can give 12. Um, and then of course, the adenosine, you kinda of use it as like a diagnostic tool, okay? It's either gonna slow that rhythm down just enough where you can really see what's going on underneath it, and maybe you then see, huh, maybe this is AFib, or this is a flutter with RVR. Um, and at that point, we'd switch over to the cardizem, okay? Or maybe it converts it, all right? Uh, with Cardizem, they've changed the dose here. We're gonna give 0.25 milligrams per kilogram IV IO. Now here's the verbiage that's a little tricky. You're only gonna give half of that 0.25 milligrams per kilogram initially, slowly over two minutes, okay? And we're gonna wait for 10 minutes, see if there's any change. And then after 10 minutes, if they still remain in AFib A flutter with RBR, then we're gonna go ahead and give that second half of that 0.25 milligrams per kilogram, okay? If they are older than 65 years old, we're gonna cut that dose to 10 milligrams max. That's it, okay? Any irregular or narrow complex, go with your cardizem, because we're assuming it's probably a fib, maybe a flutter. All right, so here's the big one here, the wide complex tachycardia, back to this issue. What's the first thing we get? Adenosine, okay? Uh, there's been a lot of arguments about this. Well, if it's wide complex, why don't we call it VTAC and give them amio? Again, it might not be VTAC, okay? So if we give adenosine, if it is actually an atrial rhythm, it should have some effect. If it ends up being ventricular, it's probably not gonna do anything, okay? Um, it takes us a little extra time, but at least we ruled it out, okay? Now we can move down to the amiodarone. <clears throat> amiodarone is gonna be 150 milligrams IV IO over 10 minutes. So again, make it a drip. Find yourself a 50 cc or 100 cc bag, whatever you're comfortable with, and run that in. I find 50 cc bags are a lot easier to use. I also recommend use 10 drop tubing. It makes your math so much easier. And when you're trying to use your thumb and eyeball a drip chamber, 50 cc bags with 10 drop tubing is definitely the way to go, okay? Now, I'm sure a lot of us in medical school were taught to use 60 drop tubing for all of our infusions. <clears throat> and I'm thinking that's because, God forbid, if our medication infusion gets away from us, that hopefully we recognize it soon and they only got a little bit of fluid in. Whereas with the 10 drop, if you don't see that it's running on you, you're gonna dump a lot of fluid, a lot of drug real quick, okay? My argument is, if I'm starting an infusion of a medication, I'm keeping my eyes stuck on that infusion and occasionally I'll be bouncing between my patient and the drug. Patient, drug, patient, drug. <clears throat> Something to consider when you're in back of an ambulance, the IVs are probably swinging and hitting the wall of your ambo, right? Um, that could alter your infusion rate, whether it speeds it up, starts dumping it, or it shuts it off, okay? So you're probably gonna have to make little slight adjustments periodically. <clears throat> Now, if you don't have Amio, we can always use Lido. Um, I don't know of anybody who's not carrying Amio by this point. And if it's irregular, wide complex tachycardia, uh, we're gonna go straight to Amiodarone for the irregular wide complex, okay? If it's a regular wide complex, start with adenosine. <clears throat> and if we're starting to see torsades, okay, that very distinct pattern, that double helix type effect, um, we're gonna go to mag sulfate. One to two grams IV over 15 minutes. I believe last year's protocols were over 10 minutes. They've kind of lengthened this one a little bit more. So again, infusion. Going on this pediatric side, I'll go up real quick. Uh, if we have a stable patient with SVT, 
Uh, remember, with kids, these heart rates are going to be super fast, like well over the 200s, mid 200s plus, typically. <clears throat> the adenosine is going to be 0.1 milligrams per kilogram up to a max of 6, and then we can repeat that at 0.2 milligrams per kilogram, max of 12. Okay. If we have a wide complex tachycardia, regular, again, start with adenosine, and then we can go to our amiodarone. Amio for a kid is 5 milligrams per kilogram over 10 minutes. Uh, and of course, a max of 150 milligrams, just like the adults. Now, if they're unstable, remember, what criteria do we use for an unstable patient? Two, typically. It's going to be either the blood pressure is super low or their mentation has decreased. Either or. Don't wait for both of them to happen. It's either or. Either they're altered or they're hypotensive. They're unstable. Now we're going to want to jump straight to electricity. Okay. So uh, there's four rhythms that we can sync cardiovert. A flutter, SVT, VTAC, and AFib. Okay. Now, technically, if we're looking at like American Heart Association, they say uh, A flutter and SVT, we're going to start at 50 joules, VTAC at 100, and AFib at 120. They also recommend that in the middle of a call, if you can't remember which one starts at what, probably a safe bet would go with 100 joules. 100 joules for all those four rhythms, you're probably going to be just fine. Now, with kids, they only want us to give one joule per kilo initially. If that doesn't work, then our repeat dose would be two joules per kilo. And then we would continue at two um, if we had to do this multiple times. <clears throat> Again, we can consider sedation or pain management when we're going to sink cardiovert, but you're probably not going to be able to do it because they are unstable and hypotensive which means we just gotta jump straight to electricity. So it's gonna feel like they're getting kicked in the chest for a split second, but they can thank you when they're feeling much better um, if their heart converts. <clears throat> Looking at our LVAD devices, um, on their device, when you look at those battery packs, they should, they will have information as far as who their physician is, where the facility is that they need to go to, and they'll have some like phone number, contact info you need to contact that physician at that facility. That's where they will be transported to, okay? Not all hospitals, very few hospitals, really manage these type of devices, okay? In the event that you cannot get a hold of their provider, here are some phone numbers and some facilities that do manage those, okay? So in our scenarios, it would be going over to Banner University, um, Phoenix, or if you had a child, we could go to PCH, okay? So just understand that we can find these numbers in our protocols. Call them up real quick. <clears throat> All right, with airway. Again, we talked earlier with those questions to the doctor with CPAP. They no longer have any um, talks about um, managing anxiety. Okay, so if you wanted to give them some kind of medication to chill them out, like fentanyl, Ativan, uh, you're gonna have to call the doctor for it. Okay. Don't forget about your supraglottic airways. With intubation, we have two attempts to intubate them. Uh, if we don't get that within two attempts, you need to jump straight to your eye gel. Um, or if you still have King Airways, but I think most of us have eye gels or an LMA Supreme or some other type of supraglottic device. Um, they used to, remember, supraglottic devices used to be thought of as a backup airway, meaning we failed innovation, now we have to go to this. Um, these can be your frontline choice for airway management, okay? If you have a code and you do a quick size up and you go, man, that's, that's going to be a tough tube, um, just drop an eye gel, okay? Especially nowadays with the whole COVID fear, uh, we don't want to put our faces right by their face and their airway and potentially be exposed to what they may or may not have. So you can keep your face away as we drop that eye gel and secure it. Now keep in mind, some patients still require a tube between their cords. Burn patients, any kind of trauma or swelling going on um, around their neck. <clears throat> Anaphylactic patients, gotta do it. With kids less than eight, we're gonna have to use the um, needle crike option. If they're older or eight and older, we can use a surgical crike. Anytime you have an intubated patient, whether that's a supraglottic airway or an ETT, uh, you have to have end title on that patient. That is a gold standard, um, one, to confirm it, and two, to constantly keep an eye on it. Uh, make sure our tube is still in the right place 
and then um, we're gonna manage our ventilation off of that rate. Okay, remember normal and tidal should be 35 to 45. If we're bagging too fast, which almost all of us are guilty of doing, um, that CO2 is gonna drop. Okay, so when you see a low CO2, consider slowing down your rate first. Okay, and if for whatever reason you get busy doing other stuff and you forget to keep ventilating, then those CO2s are gonna climb. Okay, which means we need to start ventilating a little bit faster. Okay. Anytime you innovate a patient, we should definitely remember to put an OG and an NG tube in there. I know I'm super guilty of forgetting this all the time. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll take an OG tube, uh, typically a large one for an adult, and I'll put it right in the middle of my airway roll. I'll roll it up. And so that way when I go to innovate somebody, I open the roll up and boom, there's my OG tube. And so now I remember, oh, I need to do that when I'm done. Okay. Now, I really wanted to emphasize this and I highlighted it all for you, um, which now I just completely deleted it all. Okay, if you cannot ventilate, if you cannot oxygenate, you must do what? Crike, you've got to crike your patient, okay? If you can't ventilate, you can't oxygenate, you gotta do it. Um, now, you could ventilate somebody effectively with a BLS airway. Just because you can't tube them, doesn't mean you have to crike them. Do you have a supraglottic airway? Was the BLS airway working for them? Okay, um, but if not, don't hesitate. Remember, less than eight, use a needle. Eight and older, go on surgical crike. Um, quick note, if you're doing a surgical crike, we're gonna use a 6O tube. Um, I highly recommend the finger bougie uh, scalpel technique. So you don't really need any fancy devices. You don't need hooks, you don't need spreaders. All you need is a bougie, your finger, um, and of course a scalpel to cut it. And then that's all, you'd be fine. Um, <clears throat> all right. Oh, quick note, going back uh, for the chest pain protocol. The old protocols used to mention that if we had a blood pressure greater than 120, we could give nitro without an IV in place, okay? However, in the current protocol, there's no mention of that at all anymore. So, I mean, I guess technically by protocols, we need an IV in place before we give nitro. Now, one of my biggest pet peeves is when I watch cardiac patients get stuck time after time after time after time, and they become a freaking pin cushion, okay? Um, meanwhile, they still have 10 out of 10 crushing chest pain, they're obviously in distress, and we're not treating them because we're so destined to get an IV. If their blood pressures are 140 plus, I guarantee you one nitro is not gonna kill them. Okay, treat your patient. Give them the aspirin, O2 if they need it. If their pressures are pretty elevated, I promise they're gonna tolerate one nitro just fine, okay? Of course, we need to at least get a four lead on them, see what kind of rhythm they're in, and then we need to um, get a 12 lead on them. And of course, we want to very quickly rule out maybe a right-sided involvement. If there is some like V4R involvement, right ventricle, um, then we probably want to hold off on the nitro in that case until we do get the IV, all right? Also remember, blood pressure needs to be over 100 to give nitro. Well, if they're like bordering right around those low 100s, again, I might really want to get an IV first, give them a fluid bolus, maybe 250 cc's, just to kind of um, be ahead of the curve, knowing that when I give nitro, they could vasodilate some and drop their pressures a bit. So um, there's definitely some things to think about there. Okay, what's my pressure? Do we need an IV? Can we start to treat it? Where's my MI located uh, based off my 12 lead? Um, do what's best for your patient, okay? But don't just make them a pincushion and do nothing for them, okay? All right, right here for bronchospasms. Um, this is gonna be for your adult and pediatrics. Now keep in mind there is a separate protocol for kids under two. And you'll see here highlighted that um, this is for uh, two years old. Now, again, albuterol in the nebulizers, they're wanting a lot of it. So five milligrams at a time, that's two bullets, and you're gonna repeat that as many times as you need to for that patient, okay? Whereas at your event, we're still only gonna put 0.5 milligrams in there at a time, but we can give it three times total and that's for adults and pediatrics. Last year, we were only allowed to give uh, two to kids and three to adults. Now it's three across the board, 
okay? But that albuterol can continuously roll at five milligrams at a time. Now, another thing they added was if they are still struggling to breathe, essentially what we're gonna do is give them an anaphylactic dose of epinephrine IM. So using the one to 1,000, we're gonna give them 0 0.01 milligram per kilogram IM, max dose of 0.3 milligrams, okay? Give them the solimedrol, two milligrams per kilogram. I would not make the solimedrol my first priority. That'd probably be the last drug I'm gonna give them. Uh, remember, solimedrol takes a while. Um, and I think that solimedrol is more for a little bit later. Okay, we're giving them the albuterol, the atrovent, the epi, maybe the mag right now to open them up so they can start breathing right now. Then we give them the solimedrol so that when all these other drugs start to wear off, and that inflammatory response starts to come back with vengeance, that's when the solimedrol pumps the brakes and allows that patient to recover a little bit better. Now, if we have to give mag sulfate, it's now gonna be 40 milligrams per kilogram, up to two grams. We're so used to giving two grams to adults over five minutes. Well, now they've changed the dose and they've lengthened the time. We're supposed to give it over 15 to 30 minutes. Personally, I'd probably run everybody at 15 minutes. I'd like to get that mag into them. We've done it for years. We know it works well. Um, <clears throat> so 40 per kilo, up to two, over 15 minutes. Again, grab a 50 cc bag, run your infusion formula, drip it in. Uh, if you use a 50 cc bag over 15 minutes using 10 drop tubing, it should come out to roughly one drop every two seconds. All you have to do is put the proper amount of mag into that bag. All right, with pulmonary edema, this is a new one. This is your chf -er, okay? Think about it, extremely hypertensive, probably a left heart failure. They got crackles throughout their lungs. You're probably gonna start seeing that pink frothy sputum, right? And it sounds like they're drowning. O2, O2 sats are gonna be through the toilet. Um, obviously, they're gonna be tachycardic, tachypnic, okay? Uh, mentation might start to decrease on you. As long as their pressures are elevated, which they probably are in this case, we're gonna give nitro, 0.4 milligrams, just like chest pains. However, we are gonna give it every three minutes as many times as we need to, as long as their blood pressures are tolerating it, okay? We want to bring their pressures down, but we don't wanna give them so much nitro that we tank them out either, okay? So keep reevaluating, but keep treating with nitro. Now, this treatment isn't completely unheard of, uh, typically with critical care in the hospital, they're gonna start a nitro infusion and continuously give them nitro. Uh, so us giving multiple tabs or sprays is, is a good thing. Of course, get your 12 lead. And for the airway purposes, CPAP is probably gonna be your uh, choice for treatment. Here's that RSI. Remember, for our agency, we are not doing RSI in any foreseeable future. Um, for those of you that can, it's gonna be for 15 and older. Remember, this is for adults, not your kids. We no longer have that protocol for sedation for innovation. So like I said before in the first part, is we're probably gonna reference the RSI algorithm here so we can get our doses for our drugs. Again, I'm a huge believer in ketamine. Uh, here they say 1.5 milligrams per kilogram IV IO push to a max of 150 IV. Uh, if you decided to go with Versed, you can do that too. Uh, but post innovation here, again, if you start with ketamine, you might as well keep rolling with it. Whereas ketamine initial dose is 1.5 per kilo, our continued sedation will be at one milligram per kilogram. If you chose to go with the Versed, uh, remember you probably want to tag team Versed with fentanyl. So a little Versed, little fentanyl, every few minutes just to keep them nice and comfortable. Okay, uh, of course, as long as their blood pressures can tolerate it. Um, one thing you might wanna look at, once you really manage the patient, try to stabilize them, if they're still tachycardic, consider that they might be in pain. Even though they're unconscious, their body can still perceive that pain or feel it. So remember to give some fentanyl. Uh, little doses though, usually 25 to 50 mic increments. Uh, you don't wanna give a lot. Remember, we can always give more if the patient needs it. It's a little harder to take those pain meds back. I think with that, we're going to go ahead and stop that part, and we'll be back again soon.